You know, you go to a concert and it's like punk rock music or something, and the kids get on stage and they jump into the crowd. It's called stage diving, right? Some people think that's dangerous, but not me, because humans are made out of 95% water. <laughs> so the audience is 5% away from a pool. <laughs> hey, welcome back. Uh, we're back with a comedian. Why? Because we need to laugh as much as we need to learn. And we get a lot of stress, so this helps kind of like eliminate a lot of it. And it's healthy for you. Laugh for the best medicine. Welcome, Mitch Hedberg. Hey, how you doing, Barry? Good What's to see you. Good After to see that you. Letterman stint, uh, I saw you a couple times on Letterman, right? Yeah, I, I just did it for the third time uh, a couple days ago. Third time? Yeah. Now, well, let's talk about this. Let me Take me through your background, where you grew up, and, and, and kind of, the I think, what, at age 12 was your first appearance in... Uh, on stage? I, oh, on stage, yeah. I was going to say I, I appeared at zero, but, you know, I mean, my first <laughs> stage appearance was 12, man. But, uh, you know, when you were doing that thing at the beginning of the show where you are talking about my story, man, it sounded way more inspirational than I ever thought it was, man. I kind of got tears in my eye for a minute there. I realized things are going pretty good for me, you know. Well, you, you accomplished a lot. You were, talk about when you, you know, were you a cook for years and, <clears throat> and how you made that transition. Well, I used to be really infatuated with the grill when I was a busboy. I would watch these guys cook, and I, you know, I finally I achieved my dream of becoming a cook, which was really easy because all I had to do is tell the manager, "Hey, man, do you mind if I cook?" And he <laughs> said, "Yeah." You know, it was real simple to achieve that dream. And I, <laughs> no, no, it's really the point. Is that cool? But so I, I, I actually thought, you know, cooking what might, might be what I wanted to do for a while, you know. But then, uh, since like you said, at 12 I started, I, I was performing, I was acting a lot of, like we would take, uh, we would copy Saturday Night Live skits and uh, SCTV, you know that show? Yes, yeah. Yeah, man, like uh, Bob and Doug McKenzie, you remember mm -hmm. them characters? They had that great movie called Strange Brew. But we would just copy those skits and we would make our friends laugh. And hey, of course, there's nothing like standing in front of uh, people and making them laugh as long as you're trying to. You know, I mean, if they're laughing at you for the wrong reasons, it kind of sucks. <laughs> Now, really now, this was in your basement, or it was with, with your neighborhood friends, right? Yeah, yeah, in, in my parents' basement, because my parents were the ones who would always let the kids come over and mm -hmm. mess up the house for the day, and uh, we would put on these skits, and everyone was talented, but now no one does anything in the talent industry except me. I'm the only one who survived the, through the <laughs> years, man, through the lean years. You know, they all gave it up when times got tough. They were like 15, and they said, no more of this, you know. Tell yeah. me about that, because every time I had, you know, you have Don Rickles we had on, we had uh, different comedians from all different backgrounds, and they had m many years of adversity where they were not making it, they were getting rejected. Right. Why is that important to go through that, and what uh, did you learn? Oh, uh, because it, it builds you, and, you know, it, it makes your skin tough, you know, and, uh, Rejection is, is real tough at first, but after a while, you kind of thrive on it. It's an energy in itself just to get rejected. Talk just about that. Well, because you want, you want to prove people that, you know, they're wrong, man. Like, mm -hmm. like when I first started doing comedy, people would try to tell me how to dress, and they would try to tell me like, kind of what kind of jokes to do. And they wanted me to go to, like, a, a stand-up comedy class and have some other guy tell me how to be funny, you know, man. Mm -hmm. and, and funny is natural. You know, you, don't, you can't learn how to be funny, you know. You, you can learn how to say a joke in a certain rhythm, but you can't learn how to be funny. And I knew that, but these people were trying to tell me, right, you got to come the class and, and we'll tell you like how to present yourself and everything and all <laughs> so, that go ahead no, no, so, so believing inside not letting them try to change the outside of you right right because this, this one lady at one point she gave me advice I got a lot of advice in the early days of my comedy and one lady told me to wear a lot of jewelry on stage you know because she thought like I wanted to attract the crowd, you know, just with my jewelry, you know, they'd be so they'd be so excited that I had this like brooch on or something. They forget that I'm funny, you know. Because a lot of, a lot of advice comes from people who aren't very funny. They have they have adapted ways to like remain working because they're real professional. They, they always wear a suit and tie, you know. So mm -hmm. so that, a lot of advice I was getting was from comics who who weren't that good and I, I never could take it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. man? I, I knew that I had like a a different thing to say to him, so I had I had to chill out and just. Right out the bad times like that. So, but the but you talk about rejection being able to take makes you stronger, proving other people wrong. That's a real important point. A lot of people that devastates them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have right. you ever had a situation where you just bombed? Where I bombed on stage? Mm -hmm. Oh, many situations, man. Pluralize that immediately mm -hmm. because <laughs> I've bombed endlessly. You know, I, I used to tour Montana and Idaho and uh, Oregon to these one-nighter bars. I'd go from bar to bar, and I'd be the opening act out of a two-man show, and the guy going on last would always kill. I would always bomb horribly. Then the next guy would go on. He'd have a lot of jokes about like genitalia and such, which the crowds kind of wanted to hear. They liked that stuff. But I, I didn't have any of those jokes, so I was bombing. But the only good thing about that was, is a lot of times, these towns would be loaded with kind of like scary looking women. And, <laughs> and the scary looking women would always ask the funnier guy to dance. <laughs> so I never had to dance. You know? It was cool. <laughs> cause there's I, always something good and something bad, right? Yeah, I just had to sit down because no, they were too, they, they didn't like me because I wasn't funny, so they didn't want to dance with me, you know. So. Now, now, 
now that adversity helped you? I mean, that's rejection, that's falling. It helps you kind of come back stronger. Do you focus? Do you learn something from that? Oh, uh, well, you just learn. You just learn that you know you got to get the hell out of here and find your right. You got to find your audience, man. The adversity is like you just got to keep searching for your audience. Is what it does. It just makes you search harder. Is what it does. That's good. Yeah. When we come back, I want to talk about uh, you know why you believe that jumping in. Even though maybe you're not 100% prepared, it's more important than preparing and never doing anything, obviously. Oh, that's so true, man. Yeah, you, you got to, like, uh, learn while doing, right? Okay, that's yeah, the man. only way to learn. Yeah. You got books, tapes, all this stuff, and people, but once you do it yourself, that's the real. You can't have a good job. In order to make it in stand-up comedy, you can't already have a good job. That's the biggest downfall. <laughs> really? Yeah, because you don't care then. You just, you don't care about it. You, you, you're already making enough money, so the drive ain't there. You got to, mm -hmm. like, be in a job that's worse than anything you want. That'll, that'll keep you wanting to do it, you know. Well, we'll come back with uh, something about uh, our guest here, Mitch Hedberg, who Time Magazine calls the next Seinfeld and what he thinks about that. Don't go away. <laughs>